How would you feel if in your final moments you realized the person you trusted was a monster? The car you got into was a trap, and the date you were looking forward to was actually the beginning of your worst nightmare. Today, we delve into that chilling nightmare and uncover the horrors of December 5th, 2008. On the evening of Friday, December 5th, 2008, 17-year-old Shea Kelia Anderson and her cousin Dixie Brimage were ensconced at their grandmother's domicile in Gulfport, Mississippi, engrossed in conversation and hairstyling. Their uncle, Alan Graham, made a brief visit. Upon entering, Graham was greeted by the sound of a phone ringing in the living room, displaying an incoming call from Bo. Proceeding through the residence, Graham found Anderson and Brimage in a bedroom. He informed Anderson of the ringing phone, to which she acknowledged it was hers. Graham, eavesdropping on her conversation, surmised that Anderson was preparing to rendezvous with someone. At approximately 10 p.m. that evening, Anderson stepped out of her grandmother's house. Clad in a jacket, blue jeans, and brown boots, she carried her book bag. Brimage watched her through the glass front door as Anderson approached a white Ford Taurus parked in the driveway. Anderson stood by the car, conversing with a man for several minutes before getting into the vehicle, which then drove away. Little did anyone know, this would be the last time Shaquelia Anderson would be seen alive. Welcome back to FTO True Crime. My name is Joe, and tonight we are in Harrison County, Mississippi. As of the 2020 census, the population was about 200,000. The cities include Gulfport, Biloxi, Pass Christian, Long Beach, Diberville, Saucier, and Lyman. Miss Shaquelia Marie Anderson was born on January 30, 1991, in the vibrant city of Gulfport, where she became a cherished part of the community. She was a senior at Harrison Central High School, eagerly anticipating her graduation in May 2009 a milestone she spoke of with a bright sparkle in her eyes. Shakalia was a devoted member of Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, where she found solace and joy in her faith. Her days were filled with the typical excitement of teenage life, dreams of the future, laughter with friends, and the warmth of family gatherings. She often shared her dreams of walking across that graduation stage and celebrating her 18th birthday with an enthusiasm that was infectious. Her love for school, her boundless energy, and her joy in the simple pleasures of life made her a beloved presence in the lives of everyone she met. She was the kind of young woman whose smile could light up a room and whose spirit was a beacon of happiness to those around her. And now, unfortunately, this would be the last night Shaquelia Anderson would be seen alive. The ominous departure marked the beginning of a tragic and heartbreaking story, one that would haunt her family and friends forever. The subsequent evening, Martin Smith was engaged in a hunting expedition with his dogs within a secluded sylvan expanse west of Highway 15 in northern Harrison County. As Smith scoured the dense foliage for one of his canines that had strayed from the pack, he stumbled upon an unsettling sight an unclothed cadaver sprawled on a desolate dirt logging road. With a sense of dread, Smith promptly contacted law enforcement authorities to report the grim discovery. Shortly before midnight that same evening, investigator Michelle Carbine of the Harrison County Sheriff's Department received an urgent call reporting the discovery of a body in a wooded area. Carbine arrived at the scene in the early hours of December 7, 2008. Due to the oppressive darkness, she opted to secure the crime scene and wait until daylight to begin processing. Carbine returned around 6.30 a.m., accompanied by evidence technician Nancy Kurowski and medical examiner Dr. Paul McGarry. Upon inspection, they found the unclothed body of an African-American female lying in the middle of a logging path. The deceased bore a reddish tint to her skin, missing patches of hair, and blood pooled beneath her facial area. The body was smeared with blood and dirt, showing signs of partial burning and covered in scrapes, gouges, and lacerations. Disturbingly, it also bore at least three tire marks. Near the scene of the body, 
Investigators discovered a scorched patch of grass and drag marks, indicating that something or someone had been dragged from this area to where the body lay. As they moved back towards the body, officials found shattered glass from a bottle of New Amsterdam gin and a charred piece of cloth. Pieces of glass were meticulously collected, numerous tire tracks, some forming a turning pattern around the female's body, were also present. Photographs, impressions, and measurements of these tracks were taken. Dr. McGarry, observing the condition of the body and the crime scene, hypothesized that the female had been run over by a vehicle, most likely a car. Further investigation led Carbine to identify the deceased female as Anderson. Based on Brimage's description of the man Anderson had left with that Friday evening, Graham's recollection of a call from Bo and information from friends and family, Carbine began searching for a light-skinned black male, approximately 5 feet 5 inches tall, from the Moss Point area, nicknamed Bo, who drove a white Ford Taurus. With these clues in hand, Carbine's investigation took on a new urgency as she sought to bring the elusive suspect to justice. On the evening of December 9, 2008, Lieutenant Ken McClenick of the Jackson County Sheriff's Department received intelligence indicating that Harrison County authorities were seeking an African-American male known as Bo, who operated a white Ford Taurus. Through meticulous investigation, McClenick identified Leslie Galloway as a viable suspect. Armed with Galloway's residential address, McClenick conducted a reconnaissance drive and observed a white Ford Taurus parked in the driveway. McClenick and other deputies commenced surveillance of the premises. Later that same evening, the white Ford Taurus was seen departing the residence. Officers intercepted the vehicle a short distance away, discovering Galloway and his associate, Cornelius Triplett, inside. Galloway was promptly placed under arrest. Carbine arrived at the scene and scrutinized the white Ford Taurus, noticing a small piece of potential evidence fluttering beneath the passenger side. Fearing it might be lost during towing, she carefully retrieved the item. Officers also observed fragments of broken glass on the lip of the trunk. The vehicle was subsequently towed and secured at Bob's garage. A search warrant for the car was obtained and executed by Kurowski and two other investigators. Upon raising the vehicle on a lift, Officers noted that one side of the undercarriage appeared conspicuously cleaner than the other. Pursuant to a second search warrant, the car was transferred to the Harrison County Sheriff's Department and taken to a work center for further examination. Karofsky meticulously processed the vehicle. To compare with tire impressions taken from the crime scene, she made tread impressions of the white Ford Taurus. The tire tracks at the scene match the type of tire on the vehicle Galloway was driving at the time of his arrest. Inside the car, Karofsky collected blood samples from just above the trunk release latch and from the left rear passenger door near the handle. From various locations beneath the car, she retrieved several pieces of a stringy, tissue-like substance. Subsequent DNA analysis confirmed that both the blood and tissue matched Anderson's DNA. A search warrant was procured and meticulously executed at Galloway's residence. During the operation, officers seized a collection of items including a pair of Nike sneakers, an Atlanta Braves baseball cap, a Burger King shirt adorned with the name tag Bo, and an empty bottle of New Amsterdam gin. The discovery of these objects was not merely incidental, but rather a crucial element of the investigation. Forensic analysis soon revealed that Anderson's DNA was present on both the sneakers and the baseball cap, linking Galloway directly to the victim. The significance of these findings lay in their corroboration of the evidence from the crime scene, intensifying the suspicion surrounding Galloway's involvement. During the autopsy, Dr. McGarry meticulously collected additional physical and biological evidence from Anderson's body. Among his tasks, he took swabs from various parts of her body, aiming to uncover any remnants that might aid in the investigation. These swabs revealed the presence of DNA from not only Anderson and Galloway, but also James Futch, Anderson's boyfriend. Futch, 
who had confessed to having had intercourse with Anderson days before her disappearance and death, was now an integral part of the case's complex web of relationships and clues. Days after his arrest, on December 10, 2008, Galloway was interviewed by Carbine. Under the weight of questioning, he reluctantly admitted that he went by the nickname Bo. Galloway revealed that he had been seeing Anderson since November 2008 and confessed that they had had intercourse on Thanksgiving Day. He went on to admit that he had spoken with Anderson on December 5th and had picked her up that evening in a white Ford Taurus. In the course of the criminal investigation, Carbine obtained Galloway's cell phone records from November 1st, 2008 to December 21st, 2008. These records revealed a clear pattern of contact between Galloway and Anderson starting on November 11th, 2008 and persisting every day in December up until her disappearance and murder. On Friday, December 5th, 2008, their communication was especially intense with a staggering 14 calls or messages, the last of which occurred at 11.12 p.m. Galloway's legal ordeal began with his arrest on December 10, 2008. A preliminary hearing was held on January 29, 2009, where the court reviewed the evidence against him. By June 8, 2009, an indictment was returned, formally charging him with the crimes. In response, Galloway filed a motion to dismiss on July 10, 2009, invoking his right to a speedy trial. On July 23, 2009, he was formally arraigned, and a trial date was set for February 8, 2010. Galloway's legal team filed another motion on July 29, 2009, reiterating their demand for a swift trial. However, it was on September 23, 2010, that Prosecutor George Huffman delivered a compelling argument to the jury. Prosecutor George Huffman presented the incriminating evidence to the jury that Leslie Galloway used his mother's car to drag Shaquille Anderson after he had assaulted her, cut her throat, and set her on fire using Galloway's own admission that he had picked up Shaquille Anderson on the fateful night of her disappearance and the testimony of a witness who had seen her enter his car. After less than two hours of deliberation, the jury rendered their verdict. Leslie Galloway was found guilty of capital murder in the brutal death of 17-year-old Shaquille Anderson. And on Friday, September 24, 2010, just before 2 p.m., the jury reconvened in the Harrison County courtroom for the sentencing phase of Leslie Galloway's trial. Having already found Galloway guilty of the December 2008 murder of Shaquille Anderson, the jurors now face the grave task of deciding his fate. After two hours of intense deliberation, they reached a verdict. Galloway would receive the death penalty for his heinous crime. On June 7, 2013, in Jackson, Mississippi, the Mississippi Supreme Court affirmed both the conviction and the death sentence of Leslie Galloway, denying his appeal in the brutal death of Ms. Anderson. As the court's decision echoes through the corridors of justice, it brings a finality to a tragic chapter. While nothing can erase the pain of Shaquille's loss, this resolution offers a semblance of justice and, perhaps, a measure of solace for her grieving family and friends. In this grim saga, the court's ruling stands as a testament to the enduring quest for accountability and the hope that, in the face of such darkness, some form of peace can be found. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to stay updated on true crime stories from around the world. For exclusive content, including members-only live streams, special videos, and access to member-only chats, be sure to check out our membership options. Members also enjoy discounts on merchandise. Until our next true crime adventure, take care.